Good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome you to After Dinner Conversations. This is another exciting lecture sponsored by the Washington Rochambeau Revolutionary Re Association, probably more commonly known to you as W3R. I'm Larry Abel, chairman of W3R. And tonight's program will provide an outstanding new perspective on the American Revolution. I have the honor and privilege to introduce the speaker tonight, renowned author, Larry D. Ferraro. He received his PhD in history of science and technology from Imperial College, London. He serves as history and engineering professor at George Mason University Georgetown University and Stevens Institute of Technology in New Jersey. He's a very busy professor. He served uh, as a civilian uh, our nation in 35 years in the US Navy, US Coast Guard and Department of Defense and as an exchange engineer with the French Navy. He authored two books, which many of you are familiar with, uh, Brothers at Arms, American Independence, and the uh, Men of France and Spain Who Saved It, and the American Revolution, A World War. I now present to you Dr. Ferrara. Thank you so much, Larry. I'm going to share my screen. Um, and let me also take the liberty of turning my camera off so that I'm not um, interfering with my own talk. So thanks everybody for uh, showing up this evening. Um, I'm gonna be talking primarily about um, Brothers at Arms, but um, I'll make a mention of uh, the second book, American Revolution, A World War, and questions at the end. So um, by early 1776, uh, as all of you know, America was fighting a war for independence, but it was doing so without a Navy, without artillery, even without gunpowder. Uh, only France and Spain, who were the historical enemies of Britain, had both the motive and the naval and military might to defeat the British. So we needed their alliance. But they would only ally with us if we weren't seen as fighting a civil war, they were only going to ally with us if, if they saw us as an independent sovereign nation. John Adams actually said in his writings, foreign powers could not be expected to acknowledge us until we had acknowledged ourselves an independent nation. And, was Tom, and when Thomas Jefferson was taking notes during the debate over the Declaration of Independence, he wrote, a declaration of independence alone would allow far European powers to treat with us. And this is important because um, the Declaration of Independence was not written for George III. It was um, already known, he'd already gotten the memo, it was already known that he understood the Americans were fighting for independence. He, he'd figured that one out um, as early as uh, 1775, Lexington and Concord. But neither was the Declaration of Independence written for the American people for the simple reason that it was the American people who told in each one of their state legislatures to send a representative to Philadelphia to write a Declaration of Independence. So if it wasn't written for the Americans and it wasn't written for George III, who was it for? It was written for the King of France and the King of Spain telling them we are independent, please come along, at, please come and fight alongside us. The Declaration of Independence was in fact an engraved invitation asking France and Spain to join America in the fight, which is why I say it wasn't uh, just the Declaration of Independence, but it was also the declaration that we depend on France and uh, Spain as well. Now, the Americans knew that France and Spain would respond to a declaration because they knew France and Spain wanted a rematch. Um, the war of the, the, uh, the Seven Years' War, um, which we called the uh, French and Indian War, um, was fought um, for nine years, as it turns out, um, with 
it ending very badly for France and Spain in 1763. Um, Spain lost Florida, France lost Canada, and both lost much else besides. Now, they'd already um, been closely allied, France and Spain, um, in, a, uh, ally in an alliance um, agreement or, or a pact called the Bourbon Family Compact that not only united their families, remember the King of Spain was a descendant of Louis XIV of France, so they were literally uh, uncles and cousins, um, and both wanted pretty much the same thing. They wanted revenge. Revanche is actually the word that's used in the correspondence um, against Britain, but they didn't quite want the same, um, uh, they didn't want the same, they didn't, they wanted the same thing, but they had different goals. Uh, France wanted to regain the balance of power in Europe. It wanted to kick uh, Britain off the, uh, the top stool and regain its position. Spain wanted things that were much more concrete, Gibraltar specifically, and also it wanted to drive the British out of the Gulf of Mexico because the Gulf of Mexico was the trade route through which uh, silver from the Spanish colonies passed. Now, both nations, because they were spoiling for a fight, um, predicted long before the uh, Americans even began thinking about a revolution, um, the, the two Bourbon powers predicted that the Americans were going to rebel against Britain. You can see this quote from the French foreign minister, the Duc de Choiseul. Only the future American revolution will consign England to a state of weakness. So he knew long before we did that we were going to rebel. Well, how did he know this? Because both France and Spain were sending um, observers and spies to the American colonies, people like Baron de Kalb, uh, pictured here, who later, later fought in the American Revolution, um, to get a, an idea of when that would happen. And the observers all universally reported, yes, the Americans are definitely going to re rebel against the British, but not yet. And it turned out that it wouldn't happen for uh, eight years after Schwarzschild's uh, quote. When the fighting began in 1775, the British army was being supplied by gun factories, which could turn out hundreds of thousands of guns per year per factory. Meantime, the American colonies were able to count on just a few hundred gunsmiths, not all of them um, to, the, uh, to the Patriot cause. And those gunsmiths could perhaps turn out one gun per month. So we needed weapons from France and Spain. We couldn't even make our own um, uh, uh, gunpowder. You can see the quote from Benjamin Franklin, the world wondered that we so seldom fired a cannon. We could not afford it because we didn't have any powder mills. We certainly didn't have any cannon foundry. So the first thing we asked of our uh, potential allies was arms and were supplied by the governments of France and Spain, but through um, merchants as a cover. For example, on the left, you see Diego de Gardoqui. Um, he was the Spanish merchant who first began providing arms even before Lexington and Concord. The first request came in 1774. On the right, a more famous Pierre Caron de Beaumarchais um, set up a shell company that funneled money from both France and Spain into purchasing arms, cannon, guns, uh, powder, and sending it uh, to the insurgents, as the uh, the French and the Spanish like to call us. Now they uh, they were set up as a cover so that the uh, um, actual source of the weapons and and what was not identified as being the governments of France and Spain, but of course the British were. Uh, uh, were, were not fooled. Um, they were supposed to be repaid. This was not a gift. They were supposed to be repaid in American tobacco. But in fact, um, none of these merchants um, ever really uh, saw much uh, of uh, any recompense, and they all lost money. It, turned, it would turn out by the end of uh, the conflict that over 90% of all the guns that were used came from overseas overseas 
and 30 billion with a B dollars equivalent in today's dollars uh, came in aid from overseas, especially from France and Spain. Now, Beaumarche, who I just mentioned, um, was working with the American envoy to France, Silas Dean, to negotiate a contract for these arms. And they were doing so even before the Declaration of Independence was signed or even known about in Europe. So this was all done more or less on speculation. Um, when they concluded the agreement in late 1776, um, Beaumarchais freighted um, five ships to carry arms, which eventually began to arrive in the spring of 1777, just in time, by the way, to furnish 20,000 muskets, cannon, and powder to American troops, which were beating a retreat um, in front of General Burgoyne, who was working his way south from Canada to split the Americans along the Hudson River all the way to Albany and New York. And they were losing and they were losing and then they were losing. And then the powder, the muskets, the cannon begins to arrive, which means that more and more militia and regular troops can be equipped. And so by the time of Saratoga, um, the American troops had enough weapons, not only to um, uh, fend off the British, but actually defeat them. You can see this quote by Caleb Stark, who knew what he was doing, talking about because he was there. He fought um, at Saratoga, who said, unless these Beaumarchais arms had thus been timely furnished to the Americans, Burgoyne would have made an easy march to Albany. And that really turned the tide of the campaign. It was the first major victory of the Americans that uh, knocked the, the British back on their heels, forced them to rethink their entire strategy. Now, while this was happening, um, France in particular, um, but other countries as well, um, saw a, an influx of emigres coming to the United States to fight. Now, they came to fight the British. Let's be clear. Um, they were there because the enemy, their, um, their enemy, um, was found in uh, the American continent and nowhere else. But along the way, they came to make the American cause their own. Now, these volunteers um, became uh, indispensable to George Washington, and he um, absolutely depended upon these immigrants who got the job done, as the musical Hamilton so aptly says. And a few of them are known to you. Um, the most famous ones, Louis Lebeg du Porte, was one of the uh, engineers that uh, was uh, sent over. Uh, he became, in fact, Washington's chief engineer. Um, he planned the fortifications and the sieges, which included Valley Forge in Yorktown. And he was one of those who took um, the American cause to heart. You can see his quote um, up at the top. Um, Steuben, of course, uh, was put in charge of creating the training plan that made the Continental Army, which was, quite frankly, um, a rather ragtag group of militia into something that looked like a professional fighting force that could actually stand toe to toe against the British. And of course, Lafayette, the most famous of them, um, was even at a young age, uh, uh, given command of an entire uh, uh, body of troops in the Southern theater. And he uh, kept Cornwallis from coming north and he eventually followed him all the way to Yorktown. Now, these volunteers were not initially trusted. You can see the quote by Nathaniel Green here um, in May of 1777. Um, he called the French so many spies in our camp. Now, I just am stopping for a second. I just want to make sure that everybody, uh, no comments, that uh, everybody can still see the slide. So I'm going to continue. Uh, because I can't see anything, I can't see any comments in my um, in my screen. Uh, that was before the Battle of Brandywine. Battle of Brandywine, as most or all of you know, was uh, September 1777, and that was George Washington's attempt to prevent the British from occupying Philadelphia. And he threw everything he had into that battle, including 
almost every one of the volunteers who would come over and were being rejected. Now, um, you can see the newspaper account after the fact, uh, a number of the French officers in the action displayed bravery and, and behaved well, but it wasn't just French officers. As I said, they were coming from um, all corners of Europe. Uh, for example, uh, the Polish officer Pulaski um, managed to um, mount a cavalry charge that saved uh, a body of continental troops in retreat. Um, Fleury, who was one of the French engineers, uh, was actually commended for a particular bravery in the conflict to the point where um, today the Army Corps of Engineers has the Fleury Medal, which is awarded every year gold, silver, and bronze for courage and boldness. And Lafayette um, really made his bones uh, at the Battle of the Brandywine. Uh, he um, led soldiers in an infantry uh, charge or led from behind by pushing them forward. Um, he was wounded um, and Washington, in fact, commanded his doctor to treat him as if he were my own son. And that battle completely changed the view of the Americans about these volunteers. It went from mistrust to acceptance and then to absolute reliance. In fact, Green, who used to call them so many spies in our camp, came to rely on both Steuben and Lafayette during the Southern campaign. Now, while all of this was happening back at Versailles, uh, south of Paris, um, the French foreign minister on your right, the Comte de Vergennes, was the single most important character in this entire story. He and he alone made most of the major decisions that concerned the alliance, and by extension, by large parts of the, uh, uh, made decisions about large parts of the war. Now, he was, uh, a, he was uh, um, guiding the French in the, uh, the policy of France first, which is what any nation in an alliance will do. They, they, they consider the needs of their nation and the needs of France, as I said before, were to weaken Britain and bring back the European balance of power so that um, it was tilted in France's favor. So in order to do that, he'd already decided that he could not let the Americans lose the war. Um, and in order to win the war against Britain, France had to have a complete military alliance. It was not enough to supply weapons. No matter how many weapons the French and the Spanish supplied, um, the Americans by themselves would lose. And if they lost, after being so engaged in, in war, um, a reunited British Empire on the North American con, uh, continent posed an unacceptable threat to the French sugar colonies in the Caribbean. And that's where the money was. Um, money for France, in fact, money for Britain, um, was all being generated um, in the Caribbean. And therefore, um, Vergennes had already decided that he needed to form an alliance uh, with the Americans even before the Battle of Saratoga. He was simply waiting for the right moment. The, the victory at the Battle of Saratoga simply gave him the pretext to form an alliance that he'd already decided to embark upon. Um, that treaty, um, and by the way, um, I'm going to interject. So despite many um, protests to the contrary, there was no possible way that um, Benjamin Franklin or any of the American envoys um, were directly responsible for uh, getting Vergen to sign the treaty with the United States. Um, just as no uh, ambassador of a foreign nation would uh, prevail upon the president of the United States to make a specific decision about entering into a conflict. That decision was Vergennes and Vergennes alone. Now the treaty that was signed in 1778 uh, brought France into the fight um, against Britain and more specifically, it brought the French Navy um, to the American shores. And don't forget Britain, um, that was Britain's lifeline. Um, everything that British troops needed came from across the ocean. So 
with the French Navy on American shores, that was cut off. And more to the point, Britain could no longer shuttle troops and material back and forth um, at will. So this forced the British to uh, consolidate their troops in New York City and um, hastily evacuate Philadelphia, which had just been occupied nine months earlier. Now, I already mentioned Spain was um, in an alliance with France, but they could not enter the war at this point against Britain for a very simple reason. They still had a treasure fleet at sea. It was, it would turn out to be the last of the great um, treasure fleets uh, sailing from um, South America and Central America. Uh, in this case, carrying about 50 billion with a B dollars equivalent in silver. And with that much money at stake, um, the Spanish simply could not risk uh, bringing Britain into the war and then having that convoy put at risk. So until that convoy was safely in port, um, they were gonna stay out of the fight. And when that convoy finally arrived towards the end of 1778, they were free to go to war with Britain. Now, they made use of that um, uh, period between the French beginning the fight and the convoy arriving in Spain to achieve the ends that they had uh, determined upon. Um, on the left is uh, the Conde de Florida Blanca, more or less for Jean's counterpart. And he set the Spain first goals of recovering Gibraltar and also driving the British from the Gulf of Mexico. But Gibraltar was always the principal point. Um, the British had occupied it since 1707 or 1711. Um, it was always a thorn in the side. Uh, Spain wanted it back. Now, if Spain was able to get its primary goals, um, recovering Gibraltar, without going to war, they were going to do that. Any nation would. And so Florida Blanca proposed to Britain that um, Spain would not enter the war that France had already declared. It would actually try to mediate between the French and the British, provided, provided, Britain return Gibraltar. And the British refused. Now, the British, to be uh, clear, um, saw Gibraltar as a strategic point. Um, Britain didn't just rule the waves. They ruled the waves by controlling vital, um, what are called bottlenecks or straits around the world. So Gibraltar is an example. Singapore, which is another um, bottleneck or strait that controls um, maritime traffic. Even the Falkland Islands controls the traffic uh, around the Cape. So um, Britain did not give up Gibraltar. Um, Florida Blanca went into one of his usual r rages, called it this pile of rocks, uh, giving them nothing except worries and expenses. And he went to war um, uh, against Britain alongside France. So it is not an exaggeration to say that um, Britain sacrificed America for that pile of rocks called Gibraltar. It's important to note that the uh, entry of, of Spain to, was not an alliance with the United States. They entered alongside France. Um, it was not in their national interest. It was Spain first um, to ally with the Americans for various reasons, but they did agree that they would not uh, accept Britain's surrender until the British had recognized American independence. So it was um, doing what we uh, were looking for. So in April of 1779, Spain declares war on Britain. And the entry of Spain into the war alongside France against Britain fundamentally changed the nature of the war. At this point, it went from a regional clash in North America, one small theater of operations, to a global con conflict where the British Navy and the British Army were now being spread all around the world, thinner and th thinner, and they were simply overwhelmed. Now, it was always going to be a naval war. Britannia rules the waves, remember? The combined navies of France and Spain um, were larger than that of Britain. Britain by itself was larger than France's Navy. Britain was larger than Spain's Navy. But when the two united, they had together 124 ships of the line compared with the British, which only had 95 ships of the line. And the British were overwhelmed. 
So instead of just attacking the Americans now, the British also had to contend with a potential invasion of England. So they had to defend against that. Um, they had to defend against a siege of Gibraltar because that began. They also had to protect its colonies in the Caribbean because that's where the money was. They also had to defend against attacks all the way, uh, colonies all the way to India. The American Revolution was a global war and most of the war was fought at sea. All of this was happening, by the way, in about 1779, 1780, which for the Americans was about the lowest point in the war. In fact, you can see uh, at the very bottom, there's a letter uh, from Hamilton that uh, in which he's uh, complaining that uh, if we are saved, uh, France and Spain must save us. And uh, that's to Henry Lawrence, by the way. Um, sorry, um, Henry Lawrence's son. And uh, it was a, an understanding that he had Hamilton, uh, as well as many of the uh, rest, much of the rest of America, that the fate of the war now rested on that coalition we had with France and Spain. John Lawrence, by the way, was the, was the recipient of the letter. Now, after Spain declared war in 1779, um, the French and the Spanish navies formed an immense fleet of 150 ships, 30,000 troops, all to invade England. Now, this, by the way, was larger even than the famous Spanish Armada of 1588. Now, the planned invasion of Britain, which actually had been formulated as early as 1765, in other words, immediately after the Seven Years' War, um, was intended to capture Portsmouth and Southampton. They weren't going to occupy the country, but the, the objective was you wreck the economy, you hold these cities hostage, and then you bring Britain to the peace table and you sue for the territories that you lost. Gibraltar, um, uh, specifically among them. So this massive armada um, set sail, but then they were laid low by this dysentery um, outbreak, which just devastated uh, the Spanish-French fleets. Um, it was so bad um, that an entire uh, ship, a frigate, had to be uh, stripped of all its sailors just to keep one of the flagships sailing. Crews were um, unable to both sail and fight. Even the uh, admiral of the fleet's son died. Um, Louis de Cordova, shown here in the middle, um, tried to carry out the invasion, but he simply couldn't. It just fizzled out and they had to return home because they simply did not have the manpower. You can see the quote here that uh, 100 um, French and Spanish ships um, having uh, 8,000 uh, people who were, you know, unable to stand. Now, as a side note, um, one of the things that the French Navy had done um, during this um, attempt at invasion was ask John Paul Jones, who was in um, France at the time, to create a diversion by sending a fleet around Britain and uh, you know, attacking um, convoys and uh, things like that, just to see if they could get some of the uh, British Navy to follow them, but of course, you know, no, no British admiral was that foolish. And it was ignored, but one of the things that did happen is that um, uh, John Paul Jones flagship, the Bonham Richard, um, uh, caught sight of a British convoy. Now, by the way, um, this uh, journey by, by John Paul Jones around Britain did not raise any alarms whatsoever. Uh, uh, the British routinely ignored um, almost everything that he did um, and certainly played no part in the invasion scheme. But when he attacked the convoy, um, that really caught uh, people's interest. Um, Jones attacked the convoy. Um, the commanding officer of Serapis, which was defending the, the British ship, defending the convoy, uh, protected it. Um, the convoy got away. The commander of Serapis, um, although his ship was sunk, um, was, uh, uh, was knighted because, of course, he defended the convoy. He did exactly what a, um, a British commanding officer was supposed to do. So it did catch, make uh, the news in Britain. Um, 
it made more news in the United States because although the convoy got away, uh, John Paul Jones was able to capture a much larger uh, British frigate. And uh, that really was a psychological shot in the arm for the Americans who saw this, um, this David and Goliath battle as representing um, the larger David versus Goliath conflict that they were already in. At this point in the war, things were going so badly in North America that um, this minor victory really was a sorely needed shot in the arm. Now, back on the North American continent, but further south, um, the governor of New Orleans, who was also the military commander of Spanish forces there, the man on the left, Bernardo de Galvez, um, was in charge of all of Spanish Louisiana. And as soon as the Spanish declared war on Britain, he um, immediately launched an attack on um, the uh, British outpost there. He'd already been supplying American troops up and down the Mississippi with um, arms and medicine and munitions, but this was his opportunity to, to really um, bring the battle to the British. And he uh, captured uh, Mobile very quickly. He captured Natchez, Baton Rouge, um, he was aiming for Pensacola, but he was set back um, by some hurricanes, which devastated um, the Spanish and the French, but more, uh, more to the point, really wrecked havoc on the British. And in 1781, he was able to command a joint Spanish-French for force that captured uh, Pensacola, which was the capital of the British in West Florida. So that meant that the, uh, the British were now effectively out of Florida, and that meant that the Gulf of Mexico was now um, back in Spanish hands. And with that, the Caribbean was momentarily free of um, British, uh, 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 the menace of, of British ships. And so when the Comte de Grasse, the French admiral, um, came shortly after Pensacola um, with his fleet, um, he asked the Spanish Navy if uh, to protect the French colonies in the Caribbean, because remember, um, the French and the Spanish were also uh, the French and the Spanish were also fighting the British in the Caribbean. Um, and he asked the Spanish Navy to protect the French colonies, which they did, um, so that he could take his entire fleet um, up to Yorktown. Now, the news that um, the Comte de Grasse was coming to Yorktown came as something of a surprise to Washington, uh, although Rochambeau had been um, uh, more or less uh, pushing for that. Washington wanted to attack the British at New York, but um, Rochambeau, a much more seasoned general, understood that that was um, never going to work and uh, sent word to the Comte de Grasse that the Chesapeake was a better location. So when Washington and Rochambeau received word that um, de Grasse was heading to the Chesapeake um, WR3, um, they began their uh, march from Newport and New York all the way to, um, to Yorktown. By this point, of course, the French had already um, largely departed Newport and were um, around New York. Um, and they were able to make the rendezvous in record time. Now, the goal, of course, was to encircle the, the British at Yorktown, and it depended heavily upon the naval presence. Um, Comte de Grasse, who you see on the left, was a fighting admiral, and he was loved by his sailors. They said of him, the Comte de Grasse stands six foot four and six foot five on days of battle. And uh, by the way, since I'm sure you're asking the question, um, yes, he was an ancestor of the rock star astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. That's according to Neil deGrasse Tyson, by the way. Um, when Comte de Grasse uh, made it to the Chesapeake and was able to um, host Washington on his uh, flagship, the Ville, uh, Ville de Paris, uh, Washington, who, by the way, was shorter than de Grasse by two inches, uh, was greeted by de Grasse, who hugged him uh, and said, mon petit général, my little general. And that's because de Gras actually stood um, taller than Washington. So this really happened. Uh, one of those stories you expect to be an urban legend turns out to be truth. 
So de Gras was landing his troops uh, in Yorktown, landing munitions, landing guns, when the British um, appeared off of um, uh, off of the uh, uh, Chesapeake Capes. So he quickly sortied, he de Gras quickly sortied his entire fleet. Um, didn't know it was uh, Thomas Graves, but that's who he was fighting. You can see on the right, um, kept Graves from either um, resupplying or evacuating Cornwallis, kept him out of the Chesapeake, in other words. And then he was able to go back in. And at that point, um, Cornwallis's uh, troops at, uh, at Yorktown were bottled up. His fate was sealed. And here's the point. Um, had de Grasse left some of his ships back in the Caribbean, in other words, if the Battle of Pensacola that Galvez had fought um, had not resulted in a Spanish victory that drove the British uh, out of the Gulf and allowed de Grasse to go up with full force, the Battle of the Chesapeake might have turned out differently. And that would have meant that the whole Battle of Yorktown and therefore the course of the war uh, might have been different. And that's what links the Battle of Pensacola and the Battle of Yorktown so closely. The Battle of Yorktown is already very well known. It's actually, uh, you know, the reason most of you are here. You, you sit, we, we just celebrated um, the 240th anniversary of the surrender. So um, the big details, you know, the, the march uh, down um, uh, enabled the French and the uh, Americans to surround Cornwallis, uh, the siege uh, began on October 9th, the guns blasted away while the uh, trenches were dug and the siege commenced, but it is uh, particularly important to note that it was French officers who directed that siege. They directed where the trenches would go. They directed the gunfire and the French also suffered twice the number of casualties that the Americans did. And of course, the, um, uh, the capture of the British redoubts 9 and 10 were a joint French-American effort, which um, made the situation of Cornwallis completely untenable. So when Cornwallis's second in command, the Brigadier General Charles O'Hara, came out to offer his surrender. Um, he saw the victory as a French victory. The French and the British had been fighting for centuries. The, this was one of many um, times when the British had, had actually lost to the French. It happened. So O'Hara simply saw this as yet another French victory, and he turned to Rochambeau. Um, Rochambeau understood, of course, this was a French victory, but he also understood that the moment belonged to the Americans and to Washington in particular. And so according to the only eyewitness account we really have of the details, uh, Rochambeau gestured to Washington without a word. Um, O'Hara offered uh, surrender to Washington. Washington was not going to take the surrender from somebody else's second in command, so he gestured to his own second in command, who was um, Benjamin Lincoln, and Benjamin Lincoln accepted the surrender. And that was the end of the Battle of Yorktown, but it was not the end of the war. Vergen understood better than anybody, you can see this quote, it is not in the English character to give up so easily. Now it was certainly the end of major fighting in North America, although there were another hundred some odd skirmishes and, and minor um, battles that went on, but the big battles continued around the world. And it's important to note that by the time of Yorktown, um, Britain was fighting five separate nation states, the United States, um, France, Spain, the Dutch Republic and the Kingdom of Mysore in India. And it didn't have an ally to its name, thanks to Vergen's uh, uh, diplomatic efforts, Britain was fighting alone. And anybody who's ever served in the in uniform uh, or the armed forces will tell you, um, uh, allies be going it alone every day of the week and twice on weekends. Um, these are just some of the battles that were happening at the same time as Yorktown. Um, the Anglo-Dutch War was happening in the North Sea and in the Caribbean. Uh, and that was because the Dutch were drawn into the war because they were supplying the French. Um, France was allied with the Kingdom of Mysore in the subcontinent of India. Um, together, they intended to drive the uh, British East India Company from the subcontinent. That didn't happen. Um, that uh, mushroom cloud you see at the bottom left was the culmination of the siege of Gibraltar and the Battle of Gibraltar. Um, 
it was violent and it absorbed something like 60,000 Spanish troops as well as many um, tens of thousands of French troops. So all of this was happening um, while um, the fighting was going on in North America. And it was this worldwide conflict that really drew um, the British to the peace table because it was going to um, affect their global empire and Britain lived by its empire. It already had um, given up um, any hope of getting further um, benefit from North America, but the Caribbean it needed and it was turning its sights to India. And so the last battle, um, the very last battle of the War of American Independence was in fact the Battle of Cuddalore in India. And that happened uh, six months after the preliminary peace treaties had been signed. The Peace of 1783 um, ended eight years of war. And in that time, over 200,000 French and Spanish soldiers and sailors fought in the war compared with an estimated 250,000 to 380,000 Americans. In other words, the French and the Spanish were as invested in this war as we were. So America never could have won the war without France and France never would have fought the war without Spain. And what I hope all of you take away is this. The United States didn't achieve independence by itself. It was in fact born as the centerpiece of an international coalition which worked together to defeat a common adversary. And when you think about who we are as a people today, it's our role as Americans as the centerpiece of international efforts for a common good that continues to define us as the indispensable nation. So with that, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to plug my book uh, by published by the, um, sorry, uh, David Allison's and mine and about 20 other authors books on how we pulled 20 authors in um, <laughs> to write the American Revolution, a world war, which looks at the conflict um, from the points of view of the nations that fought, authors from France, Spain, um, the Indian subcontinent, uh, the Netherlands, etc., all write about the perspectives of their nations um, during that conflict. So that's the first book that I'm plugging. And the second book I'm plugging, if you happen to be a, uh, a Spanish speaker, is Hermanos de Armas. This is published by uh, Desperta Ferros in Spain, and it's the Spanish translation of um, my book, uh, Brothers at Arms. So with that, I would um, like to, um, I think uh, I, the, the, the proper protocol is to turn it over to Larry uh, Abel and uh, ask him to take over and um, with, with questions and other, um, whatever else is needed. Do we, uh, Mike, do we have, questions in the chat box? Uh, we have not gotten any questions in the chat. Well, that means I've either done my job or um, we've, uh, we've lost the audience. It's, it's one of the two. I don't think we lost the audience. Uh, it was an absolutely fascinating presentation. It uh, gave us all new perspective. Uh, and uh, did everything that I could have ever hoped that it would do to give us this worldwide perspective on the war and um, uh, how that uh, France and Spain contributed and what their roles were. I, it, it was absolutely fascinating. I, and, I, do see a, um, I do see a note in the chat box about uh, American forges. And... Uh, the uh, the um, the cannon forges. Um, uh, unfortunately, my book is over there, and I don't want to get out of camera. But in my book, I describe that um, some of the very first um, forges were, in fact, um, uh, uh, established by French immigrants who came over right at the beginning of the war, about 1776.
and began the, um, the process of developing a series of cannon forges in the uh, Massachusetts and New England area. Before that, there were no functioning um, forges that could make artillery. In fact, um, there was uh, the case of one French um, uh, volunteer uh, who wasn't able to make, uh, uh, get his hands on a mortar and down in Virginia um, decided to uh, uh, pull to uh, uh, cobble together a, uh, a mortar from barrel staves. And when he fired it, it exploded and killed him. So the US also developed gunpowder factories also because there were French immigrants who came in and established the, um, the uh, those, those, uh, um, those powder mills. Again, their names are in my book. And um, so um, both of those began after the war had already started. My point being that we went into the war without um, arms, without munitions, without anything. It, it, it was like a teenager running away from home without a penny to her or his name. Um, another question here about, um, oh, now I have to read this. No, 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 okay. I'm, I'm intelligence, French and Spanish covert operations, de Grasse delivering the money from Havana to Yorktown, gunpowder, rifles. Okay, let me take the, um, uh, sorry, if I said rifles, I meant muskets. My apologies, I should have said muskets. I'm gonna take the easy ones first, and I'm gonna work my way. Um, they were actually mostly French, um, many were made in Liège in what is today Brussels, at the time was an independent principality, um, came through the Dutch Republic and Spain. So the numbers really um, are unclear, but they came from all over and they were uh, coming in even before the, the major battle. So yes, they were muskets. And I talk about all that in my book. Um, the de Grasse delivering money from Havana to Yorktown. Um, Washington had uh, made it clear to his French counterparts that they were running out of money. Um, Rochambeau, uh, the letters from the um, French ambassador um, and Rochambeau to uh, de, Grasse, de, de Gras said quite clearly, um, Americans need money. Um, they're not gonna fight if they don't have money. And so uh, de Gras was able to work with his Spanish counterparts um, a uh, person named Saavedra to um, uh, obtain money in Havana from the citizens of Havana. Although it's, uh, there's a wonderful legend that the women of Havana sold their diamonds to, uh, um, to give the money that, that simply wasn't true. Um, the money was eventually paid back from the Spanish treasury. Um, the French ships carried uh, barrels and barrels of um, Spanish coin, which by the way, was the unit of currency in the United States at the time. Uh, we were using pesos. Um, the Spanish dollar, as we called it, was the, was the standard of unit, unit of currency. We didn't have any British pounds. And um, when he brought the money, um, when he brought um, his ships into the Chesapeake, they unloaded the barrels and they actually stored them. And this is a wonderful little story I also talk about in my book. Um, in a warehouse and or rather a, a, um, a, a, it was a it was a home and the floor of the home actually collapsed under the weight of all the silver that had been delivered. Uh, fortunately, nobody was under it. Um, let's see. There was another one up here. Intelligence and the French and Spanish covert operations. Um, the French and the Spanish covert operations were more directed at figuring out what the British were doing um, in their own shipyards and um, arsenals than doing any uh, reconnaissance work. Um, now, this is early in the war. There's a separate role of intelligence that I uh, know that you've had um, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, I just went blank on her name, um, Derod. Um, the, uh, the Dutch slash French scholar who's been doing a lot of work with WR3, um, just finished her PhD. Um, she's doing superb work. Uh, Iris, I went blank, um, has been doing absolutely superb, cutting edge, fantastic. And I'll think of a few other words later, work on the role, not just of Chateau, 
but other officers who were doing um, reconnaissance work and intelligence work prior to the Battle of Yorktown. I'm sure you've had her on. You should have her on as often as possible. I just can't say enough about how much she is expanding the knowledge of, of what actually went on. But what I can tell you is that everybody was spying on each other um, on the European continent and France had um, officers and civilians um, wandering the shores of Britain because they intended to invade Britain. Remember that. So they were right, you know, they were drawing maps of the British coast. They were taking um, note of what was being built in British uh, shipyards. They were taking note of what was happening in the British arsenals. Um, also, they could also that they could prepare for war um, against Britain um, on British soil. So that was where most of their efforts were. Uh, what other questions were there here? Uh, De Grasse, da, da. Okay, so I did that. Talked about the forges. Rifles, yes, the, um, the Americans made rifles and I don't think that any of the European nations were um, all that keen on rifled barrels. They're very hard to make. Um, you can't produce them in quantity um, because they, are, they were so specific. Um, and they really didn't go with the um, tactics of the time, which were primarily large units versus large units. Rifles were great for um, small unit action and so on, and they were great for harassment, um, as, as uh, uh, Ralph says. But keep in mind that they were being made by gunsmiths who made maybe one rifle a month. And you were trying to equip hundreds of thousands of troops and you couldn't, you simply didn't have enough forges uh, or, or uh, smiths to turn out enough weapons. Uh, what other questions were there here? French, Spanish, and Dutch role, Galva's campaign. Ah, the, the Suffren, um, who, by the way, um, it, uh, the French Navy just named their newest submarine after um, their newest um, uh, nuclear powered submarine hit the water um, last year. I know the program manager, um, I've worked with him and they're very proud of it. It's a really top-notch submarine. And um, they, they gave it the indomitable name Suffren, um, who um, uh, the British would call the Satan Admiral. And I think that pretty much says it. I mean, if the British are calling a French Admiral Satan, you know he meant business. Uh, what are the questions? Um, Hessian Jaegers were armed with rifles. Oh, good to know. Thank you. Um, um, so forget what I just said. <laughs> um, the American Revolution eventually turned on Paris. Um, I don't see the, I, I do, there was not a connection. I don't want to say I don't see. There was not a direct link between the American Revolution and the French Revolution. It's not me that's saying that. It's most um, scholars, historians, sociologists, and other people who look at the two. Um, the French Revolution was begun by uh, problems that had been um, really lying dormant in French society for many years. Um, the idea of um, being able to rise up against a, um, a tyrant um, was great for the press, but the French didn't see their king that way. Um, they simply saw that um, they were on the short end of, I mean, it's not simple, but they were on the short end of the stick. Um, the king, in fact, wasn't originally um, the main um, focus of the revolutionaries' attentions. We have to keep that in mind too. Um, it was because, uh, although the French economy was doing re reasonably well, the French government um, was bankrupt. And it was bankrupt because um, their taxation system was all out of joint. Um, they weren't able to collect um, taxes to keep the country running because they were trying to tax the peasants. They weren't taxing the aristocrats. And when the aristocrats you know, were finally um, called, to, uh, you know, called to the carpet, as it were, and rebelled against the idea uh, of having their wealth taxed, um, this fomented, and I'm being very simplistic here, um, uh, that really fomented the, the, um, the start of a rebellion. The French government was um, 
not made bankrupt by the war any more so than in any other war. And it always managed to pay off, eventually pay off those debts. Um, the British were, uh, had spent even more than the French. They were paying off their debts. So by itself, the American Revolution really didn't bankrupt them and, and force them um, into a revolution. So I, I, am being, I talk about it a little bit in my book, um, but I hope that really helps um, answer that question. Um, how much money was made by the Caribbean, by countries growing sugarcane? Most of it. Um, a lot of their of the country's uh, incomes. These were mercantile economies. There were colonial powers. Um, a lot of that money um, came from sugar, indigo, um, rice, and others. And you know, there's no polite way to say it. Um, these colonial um, powers, France, Britain, um, the Dutch Republic to, to an extent, um, and many others um, really uh, rose to economic affluence on the back of millions of slaves who were tending the fields primarily in the Caribbean, but also in places like Brazil. Um, I don't have the numbers, um, but it was a substantial part of their, um, uh, their, their, their GDP. Uh, yeah, French King, that's uh, Ralph says, no, French King could not raise taxes on the nobility. Um, which was the, you know, which, which was the stem of, you know, the, the root and stem of the problem. Francisco de Miranda was one of Galvez's officers. Yes, uh, Miranda, there's an interesting little um, side note. We're talking a lot about the French-American um, joint operations, but there was actually a Spanish-American joint operation, and that was the um, invasion of the Bahamas. And uh, it wasn't by the Spanish government per se, and it wasn't by the uh, American government per se. Um, Miranda was part of an expedition led by, out of Havana, um, which uh, had intended to invade Nassau, but didn't have the ships. And um, the Navy of Sa the South Carolina Navy happened to come into um, Havana um, with one ship, the, the South Carolina, and uh, they struck a deal where, and again, all this is in my book. I'm sorry, I don't remember the names, but I I write books, so I don't have to remember the names. Um, they struck a deal where the Americans would transport the Spanish, they would share in the loot um, from sacking uh, Nassau. And when they arrived, the British surrendered without firing a shot on the, um, on the um, grounds that they would not actually have their private uh, possessions looted. So the Spanish came away happy that uh, they had conquered the uh, Nassau, but the Americans were um, very upset because they expected to, to make money off of this. But Miranda was, was one of the officers aboard. And when he got back to Havana, the fact that the Spanish had uh, uh, attacked Nassau without Galvez's say-so um, really made him uh, fly into a rage against uh, Miranda and some of the others. Um, long story short, Miranda was um, going to be um, effectively court-martialed. That's what we would call today. Um, he fled. He uh, went to his home of Venezuela. Um, and from that point on, pretty much decided that he was Venezuelan and he was going to use the experience of the Americans in helping him develop the uprising against the Spanish. Um, he was the first one to lead an uprising in South America. It failed, but he was followed um, uh, of course, um, by others, um, Simon Bolivar and, um, uh, and others, and uh, they successfully threw off the Spanish yoke. Um, Larry, how much time do we uh, have here? Because I see other well, questions. I think we'll take uh, two more questions and then bring it to an end. Okay. And then so far, nobody's asked the questions I expected. So I'm going to have one more question after these two. Um, one is about... David, hold on. Actually, there's several here. Da, da, da. Um, David Farragut's father, um, Jorge Farragut, was a Menorcan. Um, as far as we know, the only Spanish um, that served under the American flag. He had come in 1776, decided to stay and fought in Savannah, Charleston. He fought at the Battle of Cowpens. 
and then um, stayed on afterwards. Um, his son, David Farragut, of course, became um, the American Navy's um, first full admiral and uh, you know, damn the torpedoes in Mobile Bay. Um, uh, so manufacturing independence and industrial innovation and was not manufactured, uh, sorry, not manufactured. Oh, I know the book. Um, um, Robert Smith is saying, um, small arms for France that were old and largely defective has long, long, long been debunked um, and, and ridden out on the rails. Uh, France supplied the United States with um, the best arms that they had. They were just not the arms that the French needed because they had uh, developed a completely new set of strategy and tactics um, using Gribovol system instead of um, the older system. So the arms worked very well. Um, there were a few by um, some of the merchants, uh, Pleon and, and, uh, Pl uh, and Plissé, um, which turned out to be defective, but by and large, the ones that the French government supplied were, were um, top notch. Um, and I think there was one, Spanish were concerned about their colonies. Um, okay, no more questions, please, because I, 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 we, we have to um, wrap this up. Uh, Spanish never, Spanish were concerned um, about um, the, their colonies um, learning about the American Revolution. That's partly true, but the Spanish controlled the press. They, um, they did not let word of um, most of the American rebellion get to the Spanish colonies. Um, so that um, simply wasn't a problem, but again, it just wasn't in their national interest to uh, ally with the Americans. Um, and um, the DuPont family certainly came after the, um, uh, after the American Revolution um, during the Reign of Terror. Nobody's asked the question, so I'm going to go back to full screen and ask the question that nobody asked. So if Lafayette wasn't the most important figure, how come he became famous? And the answer is he made a grand tour of America and then he died. And I'm going to back that up. Um, first, um, Lafayette, as probably um, most of you know, um, became a um, uh, was uh, uh, lived in exile for part of his um, post uh, American Revolution career. Um, he was um, involved in the uh, French Revolution, and at the 50th anniversary or near to it, he was invited to take a tour of the United States. And it was in that tour that he became known as the hero of two worlds. Um, in fact, um, his reputation was so great that when Pershing's troops came over in World War I, um, his uh, aide-de-camp, Charles Stanton, um, used the phrase, um, we're honoring our obligation, and Lafayette, here we are, um, to explain why the Americans were there, as if that was the reason why the Americans were in uh, France during World War I. Um, but I think this chart really shows it um, best. Uh, I'm using, in this case, a, uh, a tool developed by Google to examine the usages of the words Lafayette or Lafayette. Those are the two spellings of his name um, as a proxy for his popularity. And you can see that um, while he was um, in the United States uh, during the war, you know, a fairly small amount of uh, publication. These are all by the way, prorated, so it's it's um, actually as percentage of published works. Um, and you can see there was not very much written about Lafayette. Um, when he went into exile during the um, French Revolution, um, his name came up a lot because he'd uh, written the um, uh, the Rights of Man, and uh, his his uh, exile was was uh, roundly uh, applauded. Uh, sorry, criticized by the British. So those are mostly British books. But you see that when he made his tour of the United States, the number of um, uh, references to him start to climb up. And at his death in 1834, they skyrocket. So as uh, one agent said of um, uh, Elvis Presley when he died, it was a great career move. And then um, after his death, um, it pretty much levels off. Um, his, his grand tour and his death really cemented Lafayette as the um, uh, the symbol of all um, 
international aid, all foreign aid um, to the United States and, and most specifically um, French aid. And that, that, and, and that alone is why uh, Lafayette got all the glory. And by the way, it wasn't just in English language. It was also true in French language books. And with that, I think that um, that's it. I am very happy to turn it back over to Larry for any last minute um, proceedings, uh, details, uh, actions. Well, I would just simply like to say, uh, Dr. Ferrer, we truly enjoyed your fascinating presentation. We gained a lot of knowledge and insight into the American Revolution. I'm sure if we could uh, uh, unleash the audience, there would be great accolades for you tonight. But I would say the greatest accolade would be for those that are here to go out and buy the American Revolution, a World War, and uh, hopefully we'll get uh, you'll get about 60 or 70 uh, purchases. Uh, as and a and if, you, if you happen to be a Spanish speaker, <laughs> this one too. And uh, as I've, I've said already, you know, if you haven't, uh, I, I, I guess you've invited Iris to talk, but um, you know, keep keep bringing her back. She keeps she keeps... Iris is is a regular on our program, and uh, after tonight, we hope that you will come back and uh, join us again most... for another presentation. Uh, I'll be truly... most happy to. Yeah, most honored to have you make the presentation tonight. So thank, thank you once again. You're welcome. I'd also, also like to thank uh, Randy Flood and Ellen Von Karajan who uh, scheduled and coordinated this wonderful lecture. And also Mike Boone who operated behind the scenes. And uh, we hope that you enjoyed tonight's lecture. It's one of many that we're trying to provide to expand our knowledge of the American Revolution and beyond the uh, Washington Rochambeau Trail. So hopefully we'll be seeing you again in the very near future. And thank you and good night.